Right, in one second, we're just trying to connect to Facebook Live. And welcome everyone. Welcome to the Frank Sue Foundation presents How Do We Produce the Next Frank Sue? My name is Andy Lee and I'll be your host for tonight. And we are part of the East and Southeast Asian Heritage Month, the very first one of uh, ever. So we're very, very proud to be part of that, which is organized by the organization called BC. And throughout the, this month, throughout September, there's been various a, a East and Southeast Asian events helping to raise awareness for the ESEA community. So ESEA is East and South East Asian. If I reference that, that's what it means. I've got a few announcements to make before we get going. Firstly, as you probably saw, in, if you're on Zoom, in the pop-up box that we are recording this and we are live streaming so that you would have also just got a message that we are live streaming on Facebook as well. Awesome technology. So if you're uncomfortable with having your video shared uh, on the recording or on Facebook, you're welcome to turn your video off, but we encourage you to have your video on so we can create that community feel. We also appreciate during this talk that you be respectful to the speaker and other members of the audience, as uh, this, the purpose of this talk is to raise awareness within the community to create conversation and to build the ISEA community, especially within football, which is the focus here. You're welcome to ask questions throughout the talk, which you can do through the chat box at the bottom. So you can type your questions throughout the talk and we'll try to answer as many as we can throughout the talk. But we will also have a Q&A at the end of, end of the uh, talk where we will try to address your question if it hasn't been addressed already, or you can ask your question live and we will unmute you during that time if you ask a question live, so you can ask it directly. And finally, uh, we will keep you all muted to create a smooth experience today. And if you are brought on for a question at the end, we will unmute you, of course, and then uh, you can ask your question. And that's all the announcements. Now I would be happy to introduce to you the, the co-host for the, this evening, which is Mr. Adam Lau, who is the founder of the Frank Sue Foundation and also a diehard Watford fan. <laughs> and he's going to give a little bit, talk a little bit about the Frank Sue Foundation and Frank Sue himself. Over to you, Alan. Thank you, Andy. Hi, guys. Um, I'm just going to share my screen to give you my... Oh. Do you know what? Technology is not seeming to want to work for me again. Hang on, give me one second. We did have a little intro video for you. Which doesn't want to play. Sorry about this, guys. And while Alan is sorting that out, we do really appreciate you taking the time out tonight, especially when there's a big game on TV. Um, maybe some of you are having both on screen, which is, which is pretty good, multitasking. But if you are, we hope, we hope most of your attention is here um, because it's not often we have a platform where we can sh talk and discuss some of the topics we're going to cover today. Uh, so really, really excited once we get going. So well, it's not gonna work, so I'm just gonna uh, do my <laughs> intro myself. <laughs> um, so yep, I'm Alan Lau. Um, I, I've been involved in uh, grassroots football in the Chinese community for over 10 years now. Um, what drove me to do this is, as a kid, uh, I love football. Um, like many kids growing up over here, you know, you go out and play football until the sun goes down and you come home, have dinner and then go to bed. Um, and, you know, from all the playing and all the joining of teams, there always seemed to be something that didn't really work there's always seems to be a barrier or something I mean apart from the fact that I wasn't that good um there's always seems to be oh we're not you're not supposed to do that you should be studying you should be doing you know all these other things you should be practicing violin or whatever um so there's always this thing and when I heard about um Frank Sue and heard about the story about being the first um, well, I mean, I'll tell you a bit about Frank. So he he played for Stoke. He captained Stoke. He played for Luton. He played for um, Leicester. He played for Chelmsford. Um, and the amazing thing that he even played for England, but because it was during the war, they weren't official caps. Um, he, he played nine times. So earlier, if you came in earlier, you would have seen um, the video we played 
which was England versus Wales uh, in 1943, which was his debut. Uh, and he played for England nine times. I mean, that blows my mind that someone from our background, from a Chinese background, from an East Asian background, played for England, even before, you know, he was the first non-white person to play for England. And that, that really speaks to me. When I found out about his story, when I found out when um, Susan Garner, she wrote the biography, um, when I found out about her, I just had to be involved. And I just had to set up this thing um, to, you know, to help promote his, his legacy, really. Um, so we set up the Frank C Foundation. Um, and, you know, we've been going for three or four years now. Um, we, we have three, um, three things, three, three aims really, which is to promote his legacy, um, help the Chinese and East Asian communities, uh, and also help anyone who wants to be involved in football from our background to go on their journey. And that's, you know, that's what we want to try and do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've been, we've, we've had quite a few projects going on at the moment. So um, things like the Frank Lee Foundation coaching program, which are some of the guys on that are in here today. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, the Frank Lee Foundation's communities, football um, youth uh, at Watford FC, uh, which we'll talk a bit about later uh, and also some of you might know about the ccc cup uh, the chinese community challenge cup um, and also we're working on some of our legacy things um, for example um, the google doodle i don't know if you've you guys seen this so we had a, a google doodle that came on last year uh, may the 9th um, and also the google's heritage uh, arts and heritage um, project so there's lots, lots of things that we're trying to do. And um, I see this as, as just a start of the journey, really, because I feel there's a lot that we can do as a community, as, you know, not, not just the Chinese community, but all Southeast Asian communities, a lot we can do to really promote football, get into football and, you know, promote our diversity in football. So, um with that, I'm going to hand you back to Andy. Thanks, Alan. Um, that's, it's really interesting because I also never heard of Frank Sue. And as a kid as well, I was a diehard football fan. One day dreams of playing for England. And I never knew that there was someone who did it way before I was born. So thanks, Alan, and I guess Susan as well for uh, preserving Frank's legacy and telling his story. It's, it's really inspiring. And when are we going to get the next Frank Sue? That is the question we're going to try to answer today. And I'm delighted now to introduce our guest speaker, Lawrence Locke. Welcome, Lawrence. How are you doing tonight? Hi, Andy. Good evening, everyone. I'm good, thank you. Awesome. So let's kick it off with, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into football and about your career in football. Yeah, so hopefully my, my computer works, Alan. <laughs> We the, tested uh, this all before and it was working fine. It's just, it's just shy. <laughs> yeah, I am shy. Um, yeah, can, can you see that? Or, or you can be my, yep. uh, yeah. Thank you, um, Andy. Yeah, thank you very much. And again, thank you for, for, in, for, for inviting me. And it, it's an honour to be the first person to speak. I know you, you've got a series of webinars coming up. And I think what we're trying to do as, as, a, as a group is, is really, really important. One, to look at diversity and inclusion, but also looking at how we can work together through collaboration to really look at how we can tackle the game of the stubborn inequalities that we face every day and look at how we can support that to inspire the next generation. So my name's Lawrence Locke and I'm a coach development officer for the FA and my remit is diversity and inclusion and I cover the Southwest region. So I live just outside Reading, but I cover from Barts and Books all the way down to Cornwall, up to Gloucestershire and up to, up to Oxfordshire. Um, I'll talk to you a bit more about my team later on, but we're a team of eight that cover across the country and look at how we can work with black and Asian coaches and look at how we can inspire them into taking either a career in football or even just working to inspire their community. Um, so I'm going to really just spend the next kind of 10, 15 minutes to talk about my journey and hopefully a lot of the people on the call can resonate with this. Um, so there's a red arrow there and there's, there's going to be two pictures I'm going to show and really look at how I can share where I started to kind of where I've kind of 
landed and where I'm going to hopefully continue growing in terms of my journey. So, so Ryan, who's, who's on the call, who's my little cousin, um, he, he probably knows this shop really well. Um, so I grew up here um, in Preston and that was our, our Chinese takeaway. So for, for the, the people who, who are on the call that grew up in the Chinese takeaway, that, that was us. Um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I would be working behind that counter and essentially, you know, football was kind of a thing that we watched on TV. And if you look to the side where that, I think that was my mum's old car, actually, we, we would play football on the side of that. So after school, before school, um, in, in the school holidays, we'd, we'd play to the side of that shop. And that's where I kind of fell in love with football. Um, parents were working in the shop, so they didn't have time or opportunities to take me. So really relied on friends and, and, and um, people from school to, to drive me there or I'd walk myself. And probably fast forward, what, I'm, I'm 37 now. So you talked about Frank Sue's first game. That was actually on the same date I was born. So the 25th of September was when I was born. And trying to do the maths earlier, probably like 80 years ago, that's when Frank Sue played his first game. So there's a link for me. Um, and that's where I've ended up. Uh, that's St George's Park, the you know home of England football. It's where the, the teams train. Um, so Gareth Southgate's office is around there somewhere. And essentially, I, I'm honoured to say that I can call that my work office. So I can drive in, I can go into the offices as, as, a, as an FA employee. But what, what's really inspiring, hopefully, for people on the call is that it wasn't as simple as it looked. There was a lot of challenges, lots of barriers that, you know, I had to face um, through kind of culture, but also looking different. And essentially, you know, linking into that, it was always falling in love with football. Um, so that that was me. Uh, that was me in year, year five. Uh, that was the first time I played for an actual football team. So I've got, um, I think Rich Beaumont and Kelly Shergold are on this call and, you know, they know I love my trainers. And that was me and my pair of Puma Kings and they were probably the best boots ever. And I wish I still had them now, so I'd give them to Dexter. But that was, you know, the first time I played football and essentially going to a, an all-white school, I was the only Chinese kid there. Um, but I managed to, you know, I love sport. I love playing sport. And, you know, football was kind of the, the vehicle for me to, to, to go and play football and really fall in love with it. So, you know, I always had a ball on my feet. And my mum, who came down to see me this week, said, you know, you, you, your grandma took you everywhere and everywhere you went, you had a ball. So for me, that's where I started loving football. And again, fast forward, that was this Sunday actually linking into the stuff that we're doing with the Frank Sue Foundation. So that was us at Watford Community um, in the Dome at the training ground. And, you know, I think we had 30 children there from Southeast Asian uh, heritage playing football, a group of volunteers and, and really taking their first step into coaching through the BT Playmaker. So for me, we've, we've got to ensure that the kids fall in love with football and it doesn't have to be coaching like you see on TV. It doesn't have to be about tactics. It's just creating an environment where kids are smiling, kids are enjoying it. They've got a ball in the hands, at the feet and essentially giving them an opportunity to play. And I think what was really powerful in these sessions is the informal stuff that they get. So the kids at the end, after an hour of coaching, they get an hour of just running around and enjoying, you know, being with the friends and talking and, you know, Dexter and Alan, you saw him, he didn't stop running for three he was, hours. He was all over. He was, yeah, he must and, have slept well that night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's where we want to inspire the kids to just have a ball at the feet, in the hands, running around. And it doesn't have to be football. For me, football was a vehicle that got me to where I am. But essentially, it could be squash, it could be tennis, and you know, with with the uh, you know the, the performance of Radakuna, you know, how can we inspire the next generation to take part in sport? Um, so for me, role models were really important. Um, I, you probably should know that Nakamura, even though he's scored against Man United, I'm a Man United fan. That that I remember seeing that free kick when I was at school, and I thought, wow, he, that free kick was unbelievable. I want to go and practice that. I've got an awful left foot, but I was trying to do it in my right. But he was probably the first player that I saw that looked like me. And I thought, wow, if he can do that, I can do that. And I remember the next day going behind the shop and just practicing free kicks um, and just practicing and practicing. And then as I got older, Ronaldinho, just the way he, he plays and Rich Beaumont love, knows who, who's on this call knows I love a, a nutmeg um, and the way that he, he plays just with so much flair. 
then obviously who doesn't love David Beckham and then when Partey's son came to United I was like oh wow there's another person that looks like me um, I remember Dong who, who came he didn't really play but I think I read an article recently that Partey's son was so under about not undervalued by United fans but he kind of goes on under the radar because the amount of work that he did to give Rooney and Ronaldo that kind of praise in that time and then probably in the last you know 18 months or so it's where I got connected with Alan and probably Frank Sue the more I read about his story the challenges and the adversity he's, he's faced it, it just shows that anyone can do what they want to do so for him to play for England um, and I remember I was at St George's Park about four weeks ago and I, I might be a bit, a bit longer and I saw a picture of him next to the England players with 100. And I sent you the picture in Ireland. And I thought, you know, just to see his face and see his name there, it's really inspiring. And hopefully one day we'll find that next Frank Sue and, you know, boy or girl that, you know, they can get onto that wall and, and say, look, they've played for England at least once. And they're, they're going to be the next role model, and the next game changer in this game. So I'm going to really talk to you just briefly about my, my experiences. Um, and education so went to university in Leeds but um, more importantly it's it's around the, the coaching badges that I did so for me I was probably the one of the first um, Chinese coaches to do an A license um, but with that it was really important that I had experience and exposure in there so when I completed my level one um, I went out to America and, and coached it's really important that I got exposure and, and experience and building that network to to get to where I am and as I got older um, I went and did my level two and started coaching and, and volunteering for, for different charities and really understanding what it meant about coaching football at first I was like I'm going to be the next manager that's what I want to do but actually the more I got into football it was more about developing programs for the community um, and then again as I, as I got onto my UA for B that's when I joined uh, the FA part-time and got a job in the academy at, at Bradford City and again Never used to see coaches that look like me. The amount of games we used to play, the amount of professional clubs we used to play, there was never a coach that looked like me. And there were times where I'd go and people would go, "Are you? Are you the physio? Are you the? Um, are you here to? Are you the doctor?" I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm the coach. And people would just look at you like, oh, are "You are here to coach kids?" But like, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm here to do. And then when I got into my A license, and, and that was a massive achievement for me. Um, I joined the FA full time in 2015 and I know Mark Butler was on this call and he gave me the opportunity to, to continue my coaching when I moved down south and that was an, a, another inspiring opportunity to work with kids from a variety of countries from you know, America, Brazil, uh, Venezuela, uh, Mark you'll have to uh, catch me up on, on all the different countries but it was another learning experience. So for any people that want to get into coaching, it's really important. It, you don't just think, I can only do one thing. There's so many opportunities in football and hopefully my role and the team that I work in can inspire the next generation to say, look, we can do this. We might not look like what it says on paper. However, I've got the qualifications, I've got the experience and I've had the exposure to say, look, I can go and do this and I can make a career of this. And this is just some of the you know, the different environments that I've worked in. So it's really important. We don't just say we are only going to do this. And for me, it's about challenging the norm, surrounding yourself with like-minded people who will help guide and support you on your journey. And that's really important in that, whether you're working with two-year-olds, working with adults, working in inner city Bradford, where you've got 90 children and there's me and a youth worker and six football pitches, how are you going to engage them? to working in Salt Lake City, where you've got kids that have never played football before, to delivering to a group of teachers, to really inspire them into their first journey into coaching. So for me, it was about getting as much experience as I can and exposing myself to as many different opportunities to one, support me in my journey, but also allow me to live, you know, live back onto those experiences should I ever need them. Um, and just linking back to, to my day job, so this is our purpose, is to really look at how we can identify, recruit, develop and deploy a more diverse coaching workforce. So the people on this call, if it's something that you want to do, feel free to contact me after this and look, I want to make a career in this, or I just want to do it for my, for my community. The FA is here to help and we're, we're a team of eight full-time staff, but we've also just recruited 
36 mentors across the country who can help continue and support you on that journey. That's my journey. Um, Andy, I know you've got some questions. Um, Alan, I know you've got some questions as well. So hopefully you've enjoyed that and, and feel free to ask me anything. Yes, we have plenty of questions. Thanks so much for that uh, overview of your of your life, I guess, thus far, at least in, in the football realm. Uh, I want to I want to start off in your beginnings. You talked about your love of football, your your passion for football, um, and I, and I I have a similar passion, so I can really resonate with your your story there. One of the things, especially uh, as we're from uh, Asian backgrounds, is the influence of the family. And I know for me, my parents really pushed me to to study to get a get a good job, which good job could be an accountant you know, a doctor or something like that. Were your parents uh, like that or were they encouraging you when you were in your pursuit for football? Um, they were so busy in the shop. Um, it was kind of, we're, we're going to trust you. We're going to trust you to, to make good choices and we're going to trust you to um, make good decisions, whether it be in the, in the now or in the next 10, 10 years. And um I think grandparents played a massive impact on that. So they, they would help. They would, you know, a granddad would drive me to, to places when he could. Um, so I think it's about having that trust to go, actually, we know that you will make the good, make the right decision. In terms of, you know, you've got to do it as a career. Again, you know, if you asked me 25 years ago, would you be working in football? I'd have probably gone, no. However, the more I fell in love with it and got exposed to playing it, I knew I was never good enough. Um, I'm all right. I'm not great. But I knew that I can make an impact on this. And I remember the first time I did some coaching, I think I was only probably 12, 13, and there's a local church behind my house my, my, where the shop was. And we were playing football. And for some reason, I ended up doing things like saying, like taking lead. And that's probably the first coaching experience I ever had. And I thought, I quite like this. And when I went to got to year 11 and I was doing work experience, I did it in a bike shop. So I knew sport was always going to be there. And that's where it kind of got me into teaching. So officially I was a, a PE teacher to begin with and football was kind of on the side. And I remember my wife, my wife said, how, how, how much more are you going to volunteer? How much more are you going to give up your time? When are you going to get a proper job? And then, you know, this became a proper job and it was giving up time, um, volunteering, helping, building a network and really having someone that you can talk to. So having a good mentor was really important. Um, more recently, you know, Mark, who's on the call, you know, chat to him a lot around my development. So I'm always eager to learn, eager to progress, but also not forgetting about helping others. And that's where my job, my job, I'm so privileged to it, to go, actually, I can help people now. And I'm in a position to help others where I didn't have that. It was kind of go and do your qualifications, go and, you know, give up your time and just see what happens. Whereas now I feel that I can help others and that's what I want to do through this job. Do you, do you feel that your parents ever compared you to other, I mean, it's a very common Asian Chinese trope that they'll compare you to like your cousins or other yeah. kids that they're, they're friends and stuff. <laughs> Did that ever happen to you? Um, not really. A little probably, but they, were, they never exposed me to it. Like Ryan, my cousin's on the call now. He's a PhD student but we don't compare from each other as long as we're happy and we're making the right choices. For me, it doesn't happen, but I know it happens in our culture that oh, your son's not a doctor, your son's not, uh, I don't know, an accountant, which is kind of the stereotype things that, that we go into. But for me, it was just, are you happy? Are you, are you doing the right thing? Are you making good choices? Then for me, that's where I knew that I had the trust from my parents. That's, that's amazing you had the family support. That's really great. Yeah. And how, would you say you, you naturally fell into the football coaching part or, or was it in the back of your mind that this is something I wanted to do? Um, again, it was when I was at university. Um, so I did sports, sports, physical activity and exercise science. And um, I remember one day I went to a job fair and... I went with my, my mate at the time who was on my course and um, we, 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 we walked into the, the careers fair and again, this uh, as bad as it sounds, we both went in with the same kind of 
like aspirations are we, we, we need to get a job we're at university happy to do whatever and I remember like just getting sent loads of jobs and me and my friend like literally similar backgrounds similar CVs and he got sent a load of jobs to do, to work in schools and coach and I got sent a load of jobs to go and need to be a cleaner or go and be the pot washing places and I was like I'm not doing this I'm, I'm, I want to be better I want to work in sport working in a bar or uh, you know not, I'm not saying it's, it's bad but I wanted to do something different so that's when I said look I'm going to apply for that job as well and we both applied for the same like there was a few jobs going and we both ended up doing after school football clubs when we were at university and that's kind of where I first got into coaching and my first coaching experience um, I remember I'd just done my level one so I remember giving up my weekend to go and do it when I was 18 got qualified so I'm a qualified football coach now I can go and do it I can be the next um, England manager I can be the next Man United manager and I remember going to this school in Leeds and the guy and I still speak to him now he's like there you go there's a bag of footballs 30 kids after school go and get on with this session and it was a worst session ever because I didn't know what to do so for me I was like I, that, I can't fail like I can't leave it at that so I wanted to go and get better learn and, and I think that was the best ever session that I'd ever had was that it allowed me to learn from and reflect and develop myself so yeah football coaching it was kind of PE to begin with and then I kind of specialized in football and yeah continued doing my coaching badges and yeah that's that's where I am now and I get I you know I've got the privilege now to deliver these courses which is which is massive for me is that when I was doing courses when I was growing up you know no one looked like me so now hopefully on these courses people can come on the course and go actually he's someone that doesn't look like someone else and I'm, I'm, I can make a career in this. So for me, role modeling is really important. Yeah, and it, it's amazing in your presentation when you had that picture um, of the coaching the kids in Watford, that just blows my mind because I had a similar experience to you when I was a kid. I was like the only, apart from my brother, the only like Chinese kid in the, the football summer school and, and the, all the coaches were like uh, not Chinese. So to see that today is, is really amazing, exciting. And, Thank, thank you guys for the work you're doing so far. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. No, I mean, when, when we had our first one, it really, I felt something really, you know, just seeing, you know, just seeing my kids, seeing all my, you know, all my family and all the other kids who are, you know, all from the same background and all doing this. It's just, it was amazing. Um, just, and it's, I think it's bringing us back to when um, Lawrence was talking about how, um, part of the session, um, like there'll be like only one half of it would be doing actual like activities, and then the other half they just went and played. The other thing that I really liked was that the parents were getting involved. This was a time when the parents could sit and kick a ball with their child, which it might sound really weird. I mean, I'm a, I'm a dad. Um, I'm quite lucky that I do have a lot of time when I can take him out and play football or do, do activity with them. But I know for a lot of working families, they might not have that opportunity. And having these sort of things and having it in the community, I think it's really, really useful and really, really good for the families too. Because, you know, why wouldn't you want your, dad, your daddy to, to play football with you? I mean, that's really strong. That's really important. I mean, I don't know about you guys. I mean... When, when I was growing up, I, I could probably remember only once or twice that I played football with my dad. So, you know, it's, it's really important that we're doing these things, not just, for, not just for the kids or finding the next Frank C, but even just as a community thing, just as a thing for, you know, just for the families, for the parents too. Yeah, and it's really important that everyone thinks taking someone to an activity or, or sport, it's got to be formal. And I'm... Um, you know, I'm hugely for formal, but at the same time, I'm just as passionate for informal play. And I, I don't think we do that enough. I think every time we, we take kids to things, it's got to be structured. It's got to be, we've got to do this, this and this, and we leave at a certain time. And, and I think that's where kids can tend to fall out with, with football. Let's say football, for example, because they get driven to somewhere, they get told what to do for an hour. Then they get back in the car or you know they get back on the bus or however they get home and then they're getting told what to do and I think just seeing the kids run and jump around and 
playing with different people, talking to different people, it's, it's massive. And the FA have a, a thing called the four corner approach where we've got the technical, the tactical and the physical stuff, which is on one side. And then the other one is around the social and the psychological corner. And that's, you know, vitally important. We've got to make kids socialize, but we've got to make sure that they can talk to each other and deal with conflict and be creative and be, you know, brave and be confident to go and talk to different people. Um, you know, there are times where you, you could see on Sunday and I see it a lot on, on, on pitches where kids argue and then they go and run to, run to an adult and go, oh, someone's done this, someone's done this. And it happens in schools all the time. Whereas what we want to do in, in, in terms of creating that environment is to allow the kids to resolve their own conflict, to go, actually, someone's done something wrong, but you've got to deal with it. And that's something that I did when I was working in Bradford was a lot of the social stuff that I did on a Friday night, there would be me and a youth worker. There'd be sometimes up to 90 kids playing. And these kids would be anything from 12 to 18 year olds from Bradford, inner city Bradford, where predominantly lots of um, gang crime, knife crime. But on a Friday night for two hours, their crime rate went down because all the kids were with me and, and this youth work. And I'm not, I'm not saying that it was all down to me, but it was about making them know about life choices and allowing them opportunity to have responsibility because when you chat to the kids, what, what did you do at school this week? Oh, I was in I was in isolation for a week. All right, what are you doing next week? Oh, I've been excluded. So a lot of these kids socially needed some support. Now, it wasn't about putting them in a lecture hall and going, you must do this, this and this. It, it was using football as a vehicle to go, look, these are some of the choices that you need to make. I can't referee every single game this week because there's only me and there's a lot of you. So you now need to help me. So it's allow, allowing them to empower them to go, actually, we can be in charge of this. And there were things like, they used to steal the footballs off me every single week. And they would kick them over on purpose and not get them back. And I remember there was a week where we didn't have football. So I was like, look, we haven't got footballs. Why didn't you bring any? Because you stole them all. And over time, they understood that we can't, we need to look after our own things. And if we don't bring them, we can't play. Um, they used to pay a pound a week to play. And there were weeks where they, they wouldn't come because I had no money. So I'd, I'd see them down at the shop. Well, why not come in our way? I'm going, money, well, just come. And if you can't pay, just, just come and play. And there were times where they'd run their own tabs up and say, but over time, subconsciously, they'll oh, we know we owe Lawrence for five weeks. So there'd be weeks where they'd come and say, oh, here's two weeks of money. But I'd never say no to kids playing football. But sometimes it's using that vehicle to allow kids to make informed choices, whether they're three-year-olds or 21-year-olds. It's a really... For me, sport, football is a great way to how you know to educate our children. That's that's a really amazing story, and just the power of football or sport in, in general that can make a difference. How do you have any tips for like your average Joe like myself who's passionate about football? Can I? How can I help impact my local community? Do you have any tips or things that I could do to be able yeah. to? to basically do what, be a Lawrence 2.0 in my, in my local community. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't be a Lawrence 2.0 uh, for me. Go, <laughs> go and be your own person. Um, yeah, so the, the FA have launched, uh, you know, in terms of football qualifications. Um, so in the last 18 months, we've, we've launched a new course called the BT Playmaker. So this is, you know, when we're talking about there's, there's five coaches through the Frank Sue Foundation coaching um group that are, that are on this this pathway so that's a free course and again we can we can send the link um it's a four and out four and a half hour course that you do online at your own time and that gives you that kind of first step into coaching um and that really looks at different parts around coaching but it allows you to you know say look i've done this qualification now i can go and coach kids now when we say about coaching kids it's about facilitating the environment to allow kids to, to flourish. Um, when we talk about coaching, everyone thinks drills and we've got to do things like, you know, for the ones that are watching the, the football now, you know, we've got to do what Man City and PSG are doing tonight. No, for the, you know, community football, it's about allowing the kids to have opportunities to play, giving them lots of touches on the ball, making friends and, you know, ensuring that not, not just football, but even sport to be a, kind of 
lifelong learning and that they participate throughout their, their, their life. So if they want to play football, great. If they become coaches, referees, administrators in sport and it helps their community, then you know we can use football as a vehicle to, to bring that out. Awesome. I'll, I'll be looking into that and yeah. seeing, seeing what I can do for yeah. myself. And is, do you have to be a, is there certain qualities that you need to be a coach or this, or like, or can anyone be a coach? Yeah. I, we used to ask this on, um, on, on, on the FA level one. So before it, it switched. So for, for me, it's about having empathy for the children having, you know, a passion, having a passion for it. Um, but at the same time, it's been a, a role model for the children. So empathy, compassion, and, and just having some, some passion for football, that, that, that should get you there. And you don't have to be the best player in the world. Um, so I'm trying to get my wife is, is to get her to do a playmaker. Like she doesn't play football, but she's a really good teacher. And I'm not saying everyone needs to be a teacher to become a football coach, but as long as you, you know, you like working with kids, like, developing the community you know football can be a really good vehicle for that one of the things that we have is that you do need to have a qualification to, to ensure it's safe so you know understanding safeguarding understanding first aid they're the things that again it, it, it takes away the football bit but actually it's having that pastoral understanding of you know ensuring that it's a safe environment and you mentioned so thanks for that that's um really useful tips you mentioned in your opening uh spiel that about emma radicanu and what she did for tennis is there anything we can draw from her success as someone from uh, a, a a asian or even more more so immigrant background her, her story is so interesting is there yeah, anything we can take i think it's just again going against the norm so normally people from our backgrounds either work in a shop or they go and be an accountant. You know, I'm, I'm really stereotyping here, but that tends to happen. The amount of times like I got asked, are you the physio? What, what are you doing here? Is because, you know, you're walking into environments and people already judge you. Um, I remember, you know, trying to get my mortgage for the first time and I walked in to see the mortgage advisor and he said, what do you do? I was like, um, what do you think I do? And he, he said, oh, are you an accountant? That, that was his first, you know, spiel to me. So I think what, what, you know, Emma has done is, is really inspire that next generation to go, actually, we can do what we want. And it's not just her, it's, you know, um, you know, look at the, the amount of influx of Southeast Asian football players, not just in the Premier League, but in the WSL, is that, for me, it's as long as we create that in environment, and going back to when I said it, it's trusting your children, to go actually allow them to make those choices and let them make them, not you make them. And I think that's really important that, you know, no one said, Lawrence, go and do this. It's I just happened to fall into it and really enjoyed it. And I didn't have that kind of, you know, that, that pressure on my shoulders to go, you have to do this job, you have to do this degree. And the amount of, not just in our culture, but, you know, in a lot of cultures where I meet coaches who go, I'm at university and I'm doing this course and I've not told my parents about it. For me, that, that it, it's not it's not going to end well either way. So I think it's making sure we have those positive relationships with, with, with your children, um, with, with your, with your family, with your infrastructure. So this is what I'm going after. This is what I want to try and do. If I fail, then I have failed, not, not you. And the amount of kids that you see drop out accountancy or, or they do a degree that they didn't really want to do, but they got made to do it. And then, you know, the, the six years down the line, they're doing a job that they don't want to do. You know, for me, I'm privileged to do this job. Um, I help people. That's the first thing I do. It happens to be in football. You know, whether you're 12 years old or whether you're 50 years old, I'm here to help. If I can at least give you a step up or a step across to where you want to go, um, I'm hopefully doing the best job that I can in, in this world. And you mentioned the WSL, which which is really, really cool because I... I... Now we're getting, and the, for people who don't know, the, the WSL is the Women's Super League. Am I right in that? Yeah. Yeah, and we're getting more coverage in women's football uh, today, which is which is amazing. And 
I, I, I have seen a little bit uh, of women's football. I can't say I've watched a lot, but I, I think, as you mentioned, there are a few like Asian uh, players in the, the WSL. So that's really inspiring. And how, how in your work have you seen the, the change maybe in having more girls or women in, into football and, and the impacts that is having? Yeah, it's, it's a massive, uh, we, we call them game changer objectives. So for us, it's about, you know, doubling the, the amount of participation in, in women and girls football. Um, for, for grassroots, we, we've got the Weetabix Wildcats centres. So they're predominantly, you know, in and around the country. So everywhere. So anyone can apply to be a Wildcat centre. And that is giving girls that first opportunity to go and play football. Now, a lot of the games are, are done you know, in fun games, a lot of the things that we do at, with, with the kids at the Frank Sue Foundation, and it's around giving girls that equal opportunity to go and play football. Uh, we've got a, a P unit in the FA that, that works really closely with the girls' uh, football schools partnerships. So again, really driving girls' football uh, in, in schools, because that's where essentially probably everyone on this course started playing football was probably at school. So we've got a dedicated team that really go and engage and work with teachers to go, actually, you, you can coach football, um, whether it be an after school club, um, whether it be a, a girls football team. But there's lots of support there. Um, so in my team, we're, we're the coach development officers for diversity and inclusion. There's also a team of coach development officers that look after women and girls football as well. So the FA have done a massive drive on that. And, you know, Baroness Sue Campbell has, has driven that. Um, as our you know, director of women's football, but it's massive. And if you look at kind of, you know, if you look at it 10 years ago, it wasn't professional and it's now a professional football league. And, you know, look at the names that are coming across. Um, you know, we had Alex Morgan that, that played for Spurs. We had uh, Tobin Heath that's at Man United. Um, you know, Lucy Bronze came back from Lyon, who were the, the biggest club in, in Europe. So the names are coming back. What's really important is now we've got the girls coming through England that are going to, one, represent England, but also, you know, have that opportunity to play in with this, the stuff that the PE unit doing and the girls football partnership are doing. We're really driving girls football and, you know, every girl should have that equal opportunity to go and play football. Absolutely. Absolutely. And let, let's start to try to answer the, the big question. How, how do we get more uh, ISEA, East and Southeast Asian uh, footballers uh, playing at the top level is there what can we do in our community uh, uh, to, to help man united yeah. should have given me a contract um, <laughs> 18 years ago that's 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 probably the first one um, no i think what what we're doing now is is raising awareness is is to say look there are opportunities and i think the program that alan alan has, has started four years ago is you know we're not there yet you know, we're nowhere near there yet, but we're, we're starting to, you know, a, a lot of colleagues of mine call it the, the, the pebble in, in the river analogy. We, we, we're putting ripples out and you just don't know how big this ripple is. So, you know, for, for Watford Community Trust to go, actually, here's our training ground. Here's the dome. It's not being used on a Sunday, but bring kids in to play football. And that, for me, is, it's a massive, massive step. The next step is you know, as part of my role is to go, actually, if you want to be a football coach or just someone that puts on something for kids, you've got a dedicated team around the country that supports that. So we're not saying everyone that does things for the Frank Sue Foundation has got to be from Watford. We're not saying that. Um, we're starting it in Watford because it's local to Alan. It's the club that Alan supports. It's where we've got really good links. And hopefully in the long run is we will use that model to actually, we can go to Reading Football Club next week and go, We've got this programme, we've got Southeast Asian coaches, we've got Southeast Asian players, here's an opportunity for you to play football. And what's really important is we're not there to segregate each other in the long run. It's building the confidence of the coaches, it's potentially building kids to play football. And then in the long run, they might go, actually, I want to go and join a football team now. What tends to happen is kids want to play football, they get put into a football team and they've never played football in their life. And that's where kids will fall out love yeah. with the game definitely I, I had a few parents who actually came to me and said like all their school friends are all in a football team but this kid he's not in one 
and they want to know why they, 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 they something must have happened something must have changed or he must have had some sort of experience where he feels that you know i'm not going to do what everyone else is doing for some reason um and when they brought the kid down to to our session on sunday he loved it and i think it's i'm not i mean i can't speak for every every child or every i mean for me too like when i bringing my kids up i think um at that age i wouldn't really want to put them into a normal you know coaching environment because i don't think they'll really enjoy it and it's giving them the opportunity to to play and have fun and have people around them that maybe um understand them more understand some of their needs more too because um i'm not gonna like like our upbringing might be slightly different to a Western upbringing, let's say. Um, and there might be some things that, you know, they would do that they think that is uh, acceptable, which we might think, oh, don't, don't, really want, don't like that. Don't really want to do that. So I think it's great. I mean, it was really powerful when they came and told me, like, yeah, now, now that they've come to this, they, they want to come back again and again. And the idea isn't like, I don't want to... We're not here to create football academies just for Chinese people or football academies for what you say. That's not the idea because firstly, it's a silly idea. Secondly, there's people who do it better than us, right? So our idea is to just not even plant the seeds, but just have the area for these seeds to start to germinate and let them, once they want to, they can go off and join a football academy, join, you know, a, you know those, those sort of places. Yeah, and it's, it's really powerful. It's about you know, I keep going back to how many times I said environment. So if anyone's keeping a tally, it's about creating that environment where kids can flourish. And if it's, you know, if they don't want to come, then we're losing it. For me, it's not about winning matches every week. It's not about my team winning 10-0 against another team. It's about our kids coming back. Are they smiling? Have they had a, a good experience with you? And that, for me... Maybe going back to that that question that you asked me, Andy, about what what the qualities is, have you got those qualities to allow the kids to come back and go? Actually, I want to come back and be. It doesn't have to be called coaching. I just want to come back and be with Alan, or I want to go back and work with Andy this week because I just love going back there. We, we've all got that teacher at school that you go. Actually, he was he or she was a quality teacher. It didn't matter what subject it was. I remember my PE teacher. He could take us for maths. I'd be like, yeah, I'm going because I know it's him because I know he's covering for the next six weeks. Um, for me, it, it's about creating that opportunity for the children through the environment that we create as adults. Um, too often, environments are like, we are doing this. You've got to do this. You've got to do this. But for me, success is if I've got 12 this week and in six weeks' time, they've all brought a mate back and there's 24 this week, that for me is success. And that, that's really important in, in terms of inspiring the, ne the next generation of players, coaches, referees, administrators, in, in not just in football, but, but in, in any, any sport. I want to I touch, just to switch gears a little bit, I want to touch upon some of the challenges you faced uh, during maybe your childhood and your career. And you've mentioned a few yeah. already. Um, so when you said when you were younger, you were maybe the only kids that looks like you amongst other other people in your team how did that did that impact you in any way or did you did that not really affect you um i think like with anything you know we there, there are challenges because you know you, you, you get off a bus or you i remember you know getting off a bus when i was representing the school and you're having to walk through the playground and you, you think people are looking at you differently um you know, where I grew up was predominantly quite a, a white area. You know, we had our shop in, in, in on the main road. There was another shop. There was another shop. And we were the only three, you know, Chinese families there. It's probably, there's probably more now. Um, I remember at school, there was me in, in high school and then two other Chinese kids. And um, I think it, you know, we don't have to go into detail with it, but it, it makes you really, you've got to have thick skin. You know, you just got to kind of brush off the comments. And I think, when I was younger, I probably didn't understand what it meant, really. It was just kind of, you know, people would say things, you just kind of got on with it. And I think as you got older, you see it more. And I think recently you see it even more. You've just got to kind of protect yourselves and protect each other and find that allyship within your network to, to do that. Um, 
and really, yeah, there are challenges, but for me, it's about, again, linking back to that building your network, surrounding yourself with good people, surrounding yourself with people that will help. Um, you know, the first person that gave me a job in academy football, probably, I probably wasn't ready to, to work in that environment, but he gave me a chance. And it's surrounding you with people that, that go, actually, I, I trust this person to do a job and I'm going to trust him or trust her to go, actually, I can work with this person and develop. And that's why finding a mentor was important. Um, my first PE my, my PE teacher at high school was a mentor for five years, and he kind of put me on the, the straight and narrow because at school I wasn't great, but he he helped and he, he was like, look, this is what you need to do. These are the things that you need to do. And when I got to college again, my, my tutors were, were really good to me. They were the ones that inspired me to go and go to university, which. Um, you know, in my family, like, what, what, you're going to university, and I've got, I'm no, no brain surgeon, but Ryan, who's on the call, is a lot more clever than me, like, but it, hopefully I inspired other people to come and do that. I, mean, I, I, I don't, I hope you don't mind me asking, Lawrence, but was there any specific times where there was a, a major barrier which you really had to break and really, really had to do something about and got, got through um, probably. Uh, so if I put you on the spot, that <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I think probably like I think one of the main barriers was probably when I first joined the football team. So I played for the school team, which was fine. And I think after that, I tried to join different football teams. And I remember as I was playing, I used to have to move to different teams because I don't think the coach understood that I used to have to get my bike to go to training and I'd always be late. Um, and I remember one, one time uh, I got put in goal and uh, the, the coach, he, um, I got put in goal and I made a mistake and he, he uh, I hate saying this and I'll probably say, this is probably the last time I'll say, but he went, what went wrong? That, that's what he said to me. So for the next two seasons, that's what people called me. So again, being thick skinned, I started to deal with it. But you know, I wasn't the greatest footballer, but I managed to get out of this team and played for a different team. And I remember playing against that coach another time, and I wasn't in goal. And I thought, I'm going to really try hard now, just to annoy, like, not to annoy you, but I'm going to really try my best and do you know do well on the football pitch to go. Actually, no, I I, I can play this sport, and you're not just putting me in goal because you haven't got a goalkeeper. So that was probably the probably the biggest one and that probably as I did that I got a bit older grew in confidence of surrounding myself with friends um and they protected me on the pitch like you know things were said I'm not going to repeat them now but they would protect me on the pitch and again not saying I'm the best player but I used to look like winning and I used to you know for me to meg someone and Rich Beaumont who's on this call knows how how much I love megging people I used to try and meg people just to shut them up, essentially. Like, so they might say something to me, but you know, I knew in five minutes I'd get an opportunity to, to do something. And it wasn't to kick them and hurt them, but it was to do something to make me look good because I knew I could play football. So it could be putting the ball through the legs or trying to score or making a good pass. So essentially allowing like the football to do the talking rather than getting mad and you know trying to kick them or hurt them. I guess that's really important too because it's it is I mean the best way to fight some of these things is just to to show you're better yeah yeah really important and you know always being the bigger person to walk away um I think as I got older I kind of understood it a little bit more um I remember you know going to a, a coaching course and I remember you know going into the building and someone said oh what are you here for um here's for the a football coaching course no, no you're not I am <laughs> I've got my kit on I've got got my bag on I've got my foot I'm holding my football boots and kind of the person wouldn't let me in and I was like no I'm here for the course and I had to wait for the tutors to come to go actually no he's here with, with us and I think they're the things that again as as we see more people like us in this field then it kind of probably gets a bit more accepted 
Yeah, and uh, especially f- with the kids as well, being able to use our experiences, I, myself and probably Adam, and maybe most people on this call have, have had similar experiences in their lives. And I think what you guys are doing in creating the community for, for the kids and maybe even creating a safe space where they can share these experiences and, and not just hide it in themselves and try to battle it by themselves is uh, really important. Yeah, definitely. And I think with social media, with networks and you know, even the things that we're doing at the Frank Suit, we've got a community of practice where we talk about football. And again, it's just, just, you know, just to have a call once a month where we chat about football, we chat about issues socially. It, it's really good. Whereas I think growing up, we didn't have that. Um, you know, when I, I was the only Chinese person on a sport course at my uni, whereas now you, you probably see more but it's about identifying those people to actually, you can be a role model, not just in football coaching, but you know, I got connected with someone that was a strength and conditioning coach for a, for a premiership football club. No idea that that's what he did. But again, with social media, we can start creating that opportunity to go, actually, you, you can do this. And there are people doing this that are working in different sports, different environments where you can make a career with this. And you don't have to do what it said on the tin 30 years ago. Absolutely. Uh, Alan, is there any questions? Um, we do have a few on the chats, but I think first person I was going to bring up. Um, so this event was brought to you by the Frank C Foundation, but we have partnered up with some other people to help promote our event. And one of the organisations is um, the BCS, British Chinese Society. So I'm going to bring on Gordon, who's going to come up and ask a question. Have we, have we got him? Is Gordon there? Oh, hi there. Um, should, should, I, should I talk? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, feel free to ask your question to uh, Lawrence, please. Um, is it possible I can ask two questions? Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I've been hosting uh, other Bicene um um, like Zoom meets with uh, Macy Chang, who's actually an author of a children's book, and they was doing a, um, a Zoom up, uh, with other, other basically be seen um, Asian authors and publishers. Um, I is a is a she she basically set up the Bubble Tea um, Society, basically with a collection of all other Asian uh, like authors. Do is there one for like uh, in football, uh, Lawrence? No, this is something that we're, we're trying to create. So um, me and Alan have, you know, every four to six weeks, we have a, a group chat where we chat about football. Off the back of that, it's then, you know, we're starting to get more people in these groups. Um, that's something that the FA, so, you know, going through a theoretical lens, we call them communities of practice, where people with like-minded views get together to learn from each other. And that's something that my, you know, me and the, my, my colleagues are, are trying to create around the country. Um, you know, I think we've had people from Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham, London that, that come onto these calls. And I think in the long run, again, with it, you know, we've been behind a screen for the last 18 months and now we're allowed out. Hopefully we'll get these events where we can go, you know, travel around the country where we go and see each other. Um, but yeah, that's something we are trying to create, Alan and I, through, through football and allowing people that, that want to get involved to come and learn more about football or get, get inspired to get into football. Um, and on a, an, another note, um, one of the things that I've set up on the side is um, East Year Hornets. So it's like a, well, it's, a, it's, the, it's a Watford um, East and Southeast Asian supporters group. And the idea is that we, I want to try it out here first and try and build up a, uh, a program there and then hopefully other teams other people might get together and do a, a similar thing for let's say Arsenal they have their own supporters group or you know even Man United or whatever they'll, they'll and I'm hoping because because there are similar things like that in the um, South Asian community um, and I'm hoping you know one day with all these different groups around the country with different different and then it, it all lead into having like an England supporters group and then, you know, having creating that dialogue bef- between fans too, because football is not just the technical stuff, which we're talking about with Lawrence. Foot, I mean, the, the love of football comes from being a fan a lot of times, isn't it? 
Um, so, you know, that's, that's the other side of things that I've, I've, I've been um, exploring, let's say. Um, but I mean, there's, there, there are, I mean, there are working, well, being in the football community in, in, in the um, in grassroots community in, in the Chinese um, community, I find that there are loads of little pockets everywhere. So, I mean, Gordon, I know Gordon very well. Anyway, we, we played, uh, he, he played for me at the Chinese Community Centre Football Club. Um, and there's loads of like little teams around, around London, around the country who are like Chinese centric or have uh, East and Southeast Asian players. So there are loads of little, little islands of people and loads of little islands of communities. And what I would like to do with the Frank Sue Foundation things that we're doing and we, you know, try and bring them all together really um via coaching or via tournaments or playing so um yeah i hope that answers your your question Gordon. um i i just want to bring in something um uh, similar to what you're doing actually um i was i took over uh, the bcs about three three years ago over three years ago now um it's meant to be the british chinese society so but it's meant to be every uh not only chinese but every asian brand Britain and it was solely London centric. So, so I've been traveling around like um, UK and trying to get organizers to collaborate. But during, during the lockdown, during the Zoom, there was people who like, um, I mean, I know this is a football thing, but I mean, there was people like who just wanted to be, uh, know more about Chinese culture, how to eat dim sums, bubble tea, etc. who live in isolated community. So I noticed there's a girl there called Rachel. She's actually our Edinburgh organizer. So, and you might want to ask her to come up and have a, have a word. She used to work in Rangers as well. So, so that's good uh, collaboration. I think she asked a couple of questions on chat there. But um, yeah, we was, I was going to bring, bring everyone's chat in a bit later. But um, yeah, thank, thank you for, for that, Gordon. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so other people um, who have put questions in the chat box. Uh, let me just find it. So Sarah. Um, she asks, even if there may be growing presence of Asian kids in grassroots football, do you think prevailing stereotypes uh, kicking at a certain age to mean people's ambitions are blocked uh, as they're not taken seriously? So, so say that again. Uh, so basically the question is, um, there are certain stereotypes in Asian um, cultures, I guess. Um, and how do you, I mean, what, what why what how do we break that how do we um unlock these and should we you know should these be these things be taken seriously uh yeah um i think it's about educating everyone so we might have so we, we, we're doing a lot of work with parents in sport where we're trying to educate parents around the, the benefits of kids doing sport and i'm just trying to answer it with kind of a stereotype is that you know, they, they do kick in um, and I'm not going to go through these stereotypes, but it's about educating, not just coaches. Um, and if I use it, use like a football analogy of it is that, yes, there are coaches that have been coaching the same way for the last 10, 15 years. Because we're still coaches. There's teachers who are teaching in the same way that have been teaching for the last 20 years in the same way. So my role isn't just about helping coaches that are new going into this world. It's about educating the, the coaches that are currently coaching. So one part of my job is to recruit and, and deploy. Let's, let's use that as a, as a thing. The other one is to sustain and retain. So the sustain and retain part of my role is around educating current coaches, whether they've done an A license or a B license or a level one, level two. It's about supporting them in their journey. So whether a, the coach has been coaching for, for five years and always done things in the same way, my role is to go in and go, actually, have you thought about this? Players are coming through a little bit differently. If you compare the England team that played in the final compared to the team that played in, you know, 1966, you know, the, the makeup of the team's different. The athleticism's different. Um, the, you know, the, the, the culture's different. So it's about educating the, the, the coaches. And we do a lot of, you know, CPD, we do a lot of workshops with the county FAs. So the, the county football associations that are in your local area, we work with them to put on workshops and roadshows for, for these coaches. So, yeah, th there are stereotypes, um, but in terms of blocking them, it's about educating these coaches. So actually, the game has changed. 
you know, heading, for example, that's changing. You know, we, 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 we're, not, we're encouraging, we're planning heading. So that's where we've got to go out and re-educate these coaches who are still, you know, throwing up a football 20 foot in the air and getting five euros to head a ball. We, we can't do that anymore. So sometimes we've got to go, right, we've got to go and prevent that from happening. So it's not just, you know, the, the race thing or the, the, the diversity inclusion bit, but it's sometimes about educating coaches to have modern trends of the game and making sure that they're educated as well. Do you think that this is a bigger thing though? Is it just the FA that can affect this or because, I mean, one of the other questions is um, by Brian, um, who, who says, um, talking about the physicality of things had the physical i mean yeah let's let's address that question now the physical differences between an east asian player or a a, a, a white player sorry i've got a little 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 person trying to get in sorry guys <laughs> um i mean how do you what what would you say to that what would you say to yeah so i think again historically it was you know the bigger kids would get picked the little ones won't get picked. Um, you know, probably the second best player in the world, Messi, after Ronaldo. Like Messi's five foot six and he's pretty good. So I think football's changing. Um, it's not just about picking the, the, the biggest player. So going back to the, the four corner model that we talked about, football academies now um, aren't just looking at the physical corner, the technical corner. Um, it's looking at the social and the psychological. And that's why that's just as important. So you might have, you know, you might have a, a, a 12 year old player who physically is like a 16 year old. And you, 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 you know, we do have that physically, like I see, but socially is really immature and probably lacks confidence. And again, I'm just picking, you know, these things, but then you might have a kid who, you know, who's, you know, physically, uh, uh, an 11-year-old, for example. Oh, so he might be in 11-year-old clothes, but technically very good, socially very good, and really, really confident in his ability or her ability. So football coaches aren't just looking at the biggest, strongest, fastest ones anymore. And that's where the, the game's changed. In the past, the biggest kids got picked because they could just kick the ball from their line to the halfway line and then usually the fastest player would be up front and that fastest player would run on and score the goals. The slowest players, but the, the bigger ones could kick the ball really hard and really far. So those kids would get put in defence. The quick, fast ones would go on the wing and in, in, in as a striker. What we're trying to do now is think like holistically, what, what is that player like? How can you help that player get better? Do they need help socially, psychologically? Or do they need help physically or technically? Like physically, we can't make kids grow. We can't make them stop growing. But we can help them and we can help them with their fundamental movements, we can help them with their um, coping mechanisms when the ball comes to them. So it's about educating the coaches. And this is where the, the education courses that we run are shifting into kind of more holistic development, linking into developing the whole child or the whole player rather than just going... You know, Alan, you're my quickest player, so you're going to be on the wing. Andy, you're my um, biggest player that um, you know that that, know, that loves defending because you, you, your dad said you're a defender. It's about allowing the kids to play in all different positions to allow them to flourish. Um, another question I have here is: Is there currently any easier English player that might break into the professional first team? Or the England team that you know of? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to presume it's a male or is it female? Um, so they, didn't, they didn't specify. No. Uh, so you've got uh, Dong Dee Hee. Um, he, he's at, uh, where's he at? He's at Wolves. No, so He Chang Wan at Wolves. So he's, he's just gone on, 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 I think he's just gone on loan out to China at, at Beijing Guan. Uh, it started at Knox Forest, so for, for Rich Beaumont, who's on the call, is a massive Forest fan. Um, he started at Knox County. Uh, so again, he's breaking into Wolves. And I know he was in the first team towards the end of the season last year. I know he's in around it. So he's probably the next one to look out for. Um, apart from that, 
Oh. I mean, from from my research and from what I've been, because one of the things that I'm trying to do is set up a having a database of finding these people, and there is actually a lot more than you'd think. Um, there is also, I mean, from my Watford. Uh, my, my Watford hat on, uh, we have Sonny Bluelow Everton, who's currently on loan at Yeovil. Um, he, he played he played a few pre-seasons and then got, got loaned out. Um, I think in Birmingham City's got a couple of, of Chinese lads. Um, Southampton, a lot of them are in their youth team uh, or the under-23s at the moment. Um, also at Charlton, I think there was another, another kid, kid down there. Um, but I think connect to that question, if there's any, you'll be surprised to know that Frank Sue wasn't the only person from East and Southeast Asian backgrounds to play football. Um, I mean, again, with my Watford hat on, Sammy Chung, he played for us in the 60s. Um, he managed Wolves. He got Wolves promoted in the, in the 70s. So he's, they're, they're still quite well-known people from those eras, but then... It's sort of that you don't hear about them again afterwards. Um, I think uh, Tim Jow, um, I think he was, I can't remember what, what, what teams he put, but he, he's now currently in, in uh, China playing. Uh, also, um, who's that Arsenal player? Pre uh, come through the Arsenal ranks and now playing in Beijing, Guan. Um, Nico, Nico. I know him. who you're talking about. At I can't remember his name. Yeah. Yeah. So there are there are players out there. There are people, but we don't no one talks about them. No one really knows and no one really puts these things together. So um I hope that answers your question. But there are it, it does look bright because the people are coming through. People do um without all the help that we're trying the things that we're trying to do, they do, you know, sometimes if they are talented enough. Sometimes I do find a way through. I mean, Lawrence, what do you say? What, what, what's your your take on that? Yeah, I think it's that identifying the, these players and, and following their journey. Uh, usually, we don't, you know, the, the big names. Uh, you know, are the big names that we see probably on 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 on, on the internet on, on news. But for us and and for me, that's where I you know want to learn more about it um, and. What we're trying to do at, with the Frank Sue Foundation is getting these kids the opportunity to play. Um, again, me in my coaching career, um, I don't think I ever coached a Chinese kid. You know, the closest I got was um, when I was coaching with Mark at, at Tassie School. Um, we had, you know, two two players who were dual heritage Japanese players, and they were the nicest kids ever, like really good kids. And apart from that didn't really have that even working in America didn't it was always you know n never any kids that were Southeast Asian heritage so you know just to do that on on Sunday and the Sunday before it was like that was the first time for me to oh, actually these kids look like me and they're the things that we need to do and like I said it's a ripple that we're trying to create and you know we're not we're not you know they're not all going to be premiership football players and that's you know we've got to be realistic with that for me, it's about making sure that those kids have a real good upbringing of football, whether it be football with me or the coaches, the, the parents that, that, that could potentially be their coaches. And yeah, if one of them choose to go, actually, I want to try and get into an academy or make it as a professional footballer, then, you know, at least it's, it's, a, it's a step and we've had an impact on that. I think a lot of the kids potentially, like you said, may never have played football before, but at least they've had an opportunity. And that's, that's where our role comes in. Um, just going through the questions, um, I think a lot of them are very touches on similar sort of things that we asked previously. Um, but, I mean, how do you feel, what can we learn from the recent exposure um, for um, Ovisia stars in Hollywood? Um, I think that's some powerful, isn't it? It says that we can do anything that we want. Um, you know, you know, Shang Chi. I've not watched it yet because we've not been allowed to go to the cinema. But you know, I remember watching um, Kim's Convenience. I was like, 
oh, like that was the first program that I thought, oh, wow, that's we've got like lead characters at Southeast Asian, and now he's made it into Marvel. That's that's massive, and it it could be not just in inspiring in 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 film, but it's like actually you, you can do that. And I think more and more people are coming out, you know, the, the pipeline in this. So I think it's probably a generational thing. It's so actually, you know, these 20 to 30 year olds that potentially grew up in Chinese takeaways can go and do something different. Um, you got Gemma Chan, the actress, who's again, you know, British Chinese, who's, you know, quite a good actress. Um, for, for me in my world, it, it's to go actually, can these kids be the next coaches? Can they be the next players? And if we can get one, that's, you know, that's success. Um, but the big one for me is, can we get more kids playing football? At the moment, we've got 32. We've got to, uh, you know, back to say no to people because of, you know, restrictions in numbers. You know, I'd love it. We've got a dome where we could easily ha have 100 kids playing there every Sunday. But my job now is to go, actually, we need the coaches and I need to identify and help these coaches get confident, get qualified, to go, actually, you can do this now and you can be the coaches for these kids. And we're not saying be the, you know, we're not going to create the next, you know, Frank Sue overnight, you know, these kids are 10 years old, you know, let them enjoy it, let them have fun. And then in the long run, if they want to, you know, strive towards it, then we give them the best opportunity that they have. Maybe we'll do uh, maybe one or two more questions. Does anyone want to ask a question live? Uh, raise your hand. There's a raise a hand feature in the bottom of Zoom. If you press the reactions and raise hand, we'll get you on to uh, ask your question uh, live. In the meantime, I think there was a question, I can't find it now, by Roy asking where they can find more about events for children. Uh, I'm just trying to find uh, a question. So, yeah, um, currently we're only working uh, in Watford at the moment. So we cover, you know, Watford, Hertfordshire, and we do get people from North London coming up uh, to our event. Um, and that's, uh, uh, you can find out about it on our website. So www.thefranksoufoundation.org.uk forward slash uh, community, youth community communities football sorry I'll, I'll type that up in a second on on the on the chat box um and we're i mean as i said this is sort of a a trial and once we've really developed this we're going to try and find other um football teams to work to, to work with i'll type that down now so we've got the link okay we've got someone who's raised their hand who's Got a mysterious name, named after a phone, I think. Can, uh, Joe, can you unmute, please? Can you unmute? Yeah, let me try. Awesome. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's great listening to your story, Lawrence. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, yeah, as, as a kid, I was growing up, I was, um, played lots of football, you know. You spend, after school, come out and kick a ball till the sun goes down. So, and uh, um, even later in life, I'm still playing football. Well, currently I'm not because I've got family issues with uh, health-wise, so uh, I can't continue playing. But um, I did join uh, five years ago. Um, it was called the Chinese English football team. Uh, based in West London. I, I played there for about five years uh, with the vets, and they consisted of amateurs and um, semi-pros. So that, that was a good event. And um, they had a, like a World Cup um, tournament, and that was in, in China, and that was fantastic. To play in the, the stadium, it was an empty stadium, but it was a 40,000-seater seat, stadium, but it was a fantastic experience to play. I mean, it's those kinds of things I think you need to give to people and kids. You know, to play in that kind of, uh, you know, environment, it's such, it does such a, you know, uh, such a thing to your self-esteem, you know what I mean? To play in that environment. But what I, my, one of my questions was, is, is the cost of football now, I think it's getting quite expensive and the quality of pitches 
I mean, you know, there's na I know there's like national lottery funding, but I mean, where are the grass pitches? I mean, you can never find one. I mean, it's, it's beautiful playing a, gra a, a nice grass pitch. You can't, you can't, you cannot, um, you know, replicate that on Astro. I mean, there are good Astro turf pitches, yes, but you cannot replicate playing on a grass pitch. Ask where, where, where are you based? Um, I grew up in East London, mm. but I now live in, 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 in uh, Essex. Okay. Yeah. I think there is a bit of a, the, the cost of football is, I mean, it's two things, isn't it? Because yes, you can try and book the nicest pitches or to play on and try and have all the facilities, or you could just turn up with two jumpers for goalposts. I think that's the thing about football. You, oh you yeah, make no, no doubt. You can you can play anywhere, but I'm saying if you want to, you want to get better, then you you just can't play on those kind of pitches. You need to improve your skill. I mean, skill is where you know you you're most likely to win tournaments, right? <laughs> Lawrence, what's what's your take on that? Yeah, so obviously the the, the FA, the Football Foundation, you know, government funding, um, you know, local councils, they they put money towards investing in, in better pitches now you know there isn't a, an empty pot where we can go every pitch that you see is going to be maintained and really good for, for kids to play football um for, for me like what we can do is provide opportunity for for these kids um you know i i spent probably a lot of my child playing on the street and i you know playing on the back of the shop like, that's, like I said that's where yeah. we played that was our Wembley like we didn't have a grass pitch so I think what, what's important is yes over time hopefully there are better pitches there's more funding from from there's a lot of funding grants that, that can that, that you can go and apply for which will give you the opportunity to, to pay for pitches now the thing that what we're trying to do through through the FA is and, and the Frank Sue Foundation is to try and create links with these football clubs. So you talk about first experience of football. So these kids, and I was saying this to my wife when we we're driving in. So these kids' first experience of football is going to be at Watford's training ground in their dome where the academy train four days a week and the first team use it sometimes. So they're the things that football clubs are starting to do now. We've been in conversations with other football clubs around London who are yeah. saying, yes, we want to do more for the community because we see a purpose of it. Now, again, we don't want to go to all 92 clubs overnight and go, can we use your facilities for free because we want to bring some kids into play. We're going to make sure that we've built an infrastructure that works to then go, here's a model. We can use this at another club and another club and another club. But what we need is to identify these volunteers that are going to give up their time to go and do it because Alan doesn't get paid to give up his Sunday. Um, Andy doesn't get paid to give up his time to come and do this. And what's really important is we identify, we recruit, we train, and we deploy these coaches to go and then work in the communities. Yeah, I think uh, Millwall have got a, a dome. Which yeah, I've played in a few times, and uh, it's subsidised. Yeah, I mean you can play yeah. in a nice, yeah, a nice environment. Yeah, and a lot of the facilities that get built will have part of their funding will be so. Part of it will be that these communities can come and use it for a lot cheaper than a, a private entity coming in. Um, yeah. I run a session for a group of dads on a Friday night and we we get it for a, a little bit cheaper than what someone um, privately has to pay for it. So part of the funding and part of the Football Foundation funding is that they've got to give back to the community and they can't charge really expensive prices. But, but yeah, I'd love to just go, here's... 50 million carpets that kids can go and play on overnight, but, you know, we, we don't have that and land's expensive down south. Yeah, but I, I think I always believe that you, you, if you want to develop someone, you, then you develop your own. You create your own association, Chinese association, whatever it is, football association, yeah. and you create your own. That's, I think that's the quickest way forward. Yeah. Personally. Yeah, and, and yeah, and there's no, you know, you know, that's what people have done. So I know in Yorkshire, they've created their own kind of country that play against different counties. So yeah. I know in Yorkshire, they've done something like that. Okay. Should we take the next question? Is that Mike or Ho? Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Hi. I 
I want to put my messy office on while I threw out the door. So I just, um, yeah, I hadn't heard of Frank Sue either. I had, I bought the book because I was, I'm like mixed race. My dad's from Hong Kong and my mum's from Liverpool and I'm a filmmaker and I wanted to make a film about the, the Liverpool kind of Chinatown, which is the oldest in Europe. And which I didn't know again at the time. I remember going there as a kid and then I found out it had been there since like the mid 19th century and stuff. And I just wonder like, we've all heard of Frank Sue now, you know, and he's in this amazing character. He looks like a sort of matinee idol, you know, and he's got this amazing story, but it's still a bit, I think a very niche story. When I, when I researched it, I saw these, you know, small, um, small news pieces on like local, you know, local sort of BBC news. But um, I just wonder what you think about the, you know, the role that the media or that, that kind of, you know, um, um, books or films have to play in kind of making these people more prominent. Because I think if more people knew about Frank Su, you know, it would probably be something that could attract more Chinese kids into it. It would give them that kind of a role model and that, you know, that sort of sense of, of yeah, as you say, somebody has been there. So yeah, I just wondered what, you know, you guys think about the, role that characters like this have to play in you know creating a kind of a, a um an alternative history you know of the of the chinese in the uk because i think it's a very yeah basically everyone just associates it with like chinese takeaways and stuff and there's much more much more to you know the community all over the country yeah um yeah i mean i think you're, you're totally right it is very important um and i think like i'm often asked well i'm often in situations where it, you know, I'm banging the drum about Frank Sue, but then I would also come across a, a really interesting story about another character from a different background. Um, and it's, it's about just bringing all these things together, really. It's about sharing these things. Um, I mean, we're working towards a lot of, other, on a few other projects, trying to work with the media, trying to do things in, you know, people have approached us about these things. Um, so we definitely, we definitely got our eye out for, for this. And it is very important. You're right. I mean, as, as Donald was saying earlier about um, Shang-Chi, like things like that, things, you know, before, you know, he's a bloody Chinese superhero. I mean, <laughs> I, I wasn't going to go until I found out Tony Leung's in it. And now I'm definitely <laughs> going to go and see it. Because <laughs> I'm not normally into like superhero movies, but Tony Leung has like made it a, a definite... <laughs> But I mean, it's it's important, definitely, definitely, really important that, and um, I think it's important for you to do like what you, your the project you're working on. If you want to talk, tell the story about Liverpool, um, I know a few people up there who, who might be interested in, in helping you out there. But it's really, it is a very, you know, it is well, part of our I mean, heritage. The reason I found out is because Frank seems from Liverpool, which yeah, um, from the yeah, yeah, he was he was you know part of that kind of early generation that went in and that's how that, that's how I initially found out about him as a person and then I was like oh wow he's got this amazing story. Mm. Lawrence do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think Michael go and um, get some investors and make a film. <laughs> well that's no. yeah I, 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 um, I, I've no. to people up there and it's like I think yeah exactly I just need to kind of get some stuff what my plan was to do is go and talk to people so I've got audio stuff first and then pitch it on the basis of these stories because I think these kind of old things it's very difficult to get anything picture wise you know yeah yes um, yeah and that's why I thought the film I wanted to make with him I thought it would be like an animated documentary so you could okay. bring sequence a bit like Roy of the Rovers sequences you know for Frank's part of the story and um you could do a lot of stuff with the audio interview that you could use yeah because I think it's hard to make a film of you know when you can't there's nothing to watch yeah, there, there's very, I mean, I've been trawling through film, trying to find film footage of him. Um, and and trying it's far to find, and few between, I'd imagine. Yeah, and even just find, like, I'll, I'll show you some of the stuff I've, I've bought off eBay. Stuff like, you know, I have a little program which has his his name in it. He's, he's in there. So you can see it. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah. Left so this, fullback. Yeah, uh, uh, left... Sent, half uh, back, left it? half back that's it half back um, <laughs> these positions that don't exist anymore <laughs> and then like things like that you do you can find little things like this um but you're right this it's very hard to find and and to be honest it's very hard to find anyone nowadays that has probably seen him play because he is yeah. i mean he was born in 19 the 1910s something like that 1910s 1920s sort of time yeah. so he would have been yeah 
he finished playing in the in the fifties. So it's it'll be even hard finding first hand people who've who've seen him too. So Maybe yeah, but good luck with that. That's that's <laughs> very yeah. I mean, if you need any help, you want to have a chat about these things separately. I mean, it would be, it'd be great to be involved in that sort of. Thing. I might do that because, like I say, you know, I stumbled across him in the, doing my research about Liverpool. But actually, you know, I, yeah, I definitely have an idea for you know trying to make a film centered around his story because I think it's fascinating. I think even if it was a small film that went to festivals, it would still be something that you know hopefully could uh, raise awareness. Um, I think um, it's things like that, Michael, where, you know, it is about raising awareness. So we've got X amount of people on this call. And if you tell one person about Frank Sue, it's another, it's a, you know, it spreads a message. And, you know, saying to Alan at the start and Andy at the start and Joe at the start, that my mum was asking who Frank Sue was. And, you know, she's Chinese. Well, and when the I went to Liverpool, to yeah. I had the same experience when I went to Liverpool. You know, I spoke to quite a few because I, I went up and did a bunch of research for this project. And lots of the guys from the, you know, the Liverpool Chinese community also had never heard of him. Some oh, of them yeah. had, but quite a few of them didn't, didn't had never heard his name before. And they were actually amazed. You know, they were really like, wow, you know, he came from here. And then yeah. um, I regularly had that same like, conversation with like relatives and friends who like, you know, of the of an older generation who's like never never heard of this guy. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that, Michael. Brilliant. Great. Well, yeah, I've, it's been a fascinating talk. And um, yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, Andy? Cool. I think we'll wrap it up for now. So thank you, everyone, for joining. And thank you for all the questions. And thank you, uh, Lawrence, for the amazing talk. And Alan for putting, putting this together. And obviously, Joe, for the tech side. Um, we can keep in contact through the various channels, through Lawrence by the FA, uh, Alan through the Frank Sue Foundation. And this is just the beginning. This is our very first talk and we have a lot more in the pipeline, so stay tuned. Hope everyone has a good evening. You can now catch the second half of the game if you <laughs> want to. Um, um, yes, uh, Lawrence has just put his email, uh, his contact details in the chat, so if you want to get in touch with him, uh, take those as notes. We will also send out an email. So if you signed up on the Eventbrite, we'll send you an email with all the details as well, how to get in, reach, reach everyone. All right, thank you everyone. And we'll see you next time. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.